So uh, yeah, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity to come out here. It's uh, been quite nice. Um, as of last month, I changed hemispheres to uh, Sydney, Australia. So most of the work I'll talk about was done in the group of Peter Zoller in Innsbruck. Um, so most of what I want to talk about today is uh, some approaches to try to realize in physical systems, particularly atomic and molecular systems, ways to um, obtain highly correlated many-body states which could be used for protected quantum memories. And protected, I mean in the sense that there's some kind of built-in structure which makes them resilience, resilient to some level against noise. So the, sort of the, the philosophy is that if we can you know, build in some resilience to noise at the hardware level, then that might ease up some of the requirements at the software level, which could reduce the number of resources and operations necessary to protect information. Um, and in particular, I want to focus on uh, spin lattice models. So this would be, uh, you know, uh, some, some spins that will be in a regular array. And I'll be looking at interactions among small neighborhoods of spins. Um, in particular, uh, focusing on ways one might implement uh, subsystem codes or surface codes, at least some uh, fairly simple versions of the same. And um, the uh, mechanism for doing that will be what I call an analog simulation with uh, atomic molecular or optical systems. And by analog, I just mean that I'll be looking at ways you could engineer a Hamiltonian that will be left always on. So there will be no stroboscopic pulsing to sort of approximate a Hamiltonian, but it will be engineering the microscopic physics so that you approximate what you want to have. And the hope is that even if you don't get it exactly right, you might still maintain some of the properties that you would find desirable. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about ways one can design spin half or, or spin one interactions uh, with atoms or molecules trapped in optical lattices. Uh, I'll describe what those are in a minute. and. Um, discuss some applications in terms of uh, spin chains that can be used for quantum communication as well as protected quantum memories. Um, now, one of the things that's kind of been not so clear about um, working with these kinds of systems is how, is how you would actually perform desirable coherent control. Uh, in many of these systems, the operations to perform logical gates involve global operators or products of spins across an extensive region of the system. So uh, I'll talk about some, some newer ideas on implementing string or planar operators. And then if there's time, but maybe not, uh, discuss maybe what would be an idea for doing a digital simulation of an ENIA model. And by digital, I mean something along the lines that uh, Janos Pakos described yesterday, where you don't have an always-on Hamiltonian in the background, but you perform a sequence of operations on a set of spins, which would simulate the action of braiding within uh, some topological phase. So it's sort of an algorithmic construction, but there would be no energy gap against unwanted errors. Um, OK. so. Uh, Dave Bacon gave us a, a very nice introduction yesterday, uh, or even more than an introduction, really. Uh, fairly thorough discussion of uh, subsystem codes. And um, the, the general idea here is that you want to encode in a, in a small subsystem of uh, some many body state. And uh, the reasons for doing this might be that. One, if the many-body state corresponds to ground states of a Hamiltonian, there might be a gap against excitations. At least for small or system sizes, there could be a gap. And so there would be some protection against errors at that level. And, but also, 
you might have a structure so that your logical gate operations would be highly non-local strings or domains of operations, which the environment would be very unlikely to do. So hopefully the human would be able to do operations that the environment can't on a, on a reasonable time scale. And um, so that sort of the canonical description here is that your Hilbert space splits up into a, one of these factors would correspond to a subsystem where you can encode information. Um, and uh, a particularly nice realization of this is uh, described by the 2D compass model, uh, where you have uh, spins on the vertices of a lattice, and we have xx interactions along the x direction and zz along the z direction. And um, you have a set of conserved quantities corresponding to pairs of strings of z operations, and because pairs of polys commute with pairs of polys, those will commute with a Hamiltonian, and they'll also commute with themselves as well as pairs of X string operators. So they, they square to the identity, so we have plus and minus one eigenvalues, and um, this forms then, uh, this, these pairs will generate, uh, 2N minus one of these pairs will generate the stabilizer group. But we also have a set of logical operators which will commute with the Hamiltonian and with the stabilizers, but will anti-commute with each other. And in particular, uh, these string, single strings collide at one point, so they anti-commute. And these operations then would correspond to logical operations on your qubit. So this turns out then to be described as an n squared one n code. Uh, so one logical qubits and n squared physical qubits. And then there's an extension to 3D, a 3D compass model with uh, x, x, y, y, and z, z interactions. And the idea is quite similar, except now your, your conserved quantities are planar operators. And our logical operators correspond to, for instance, a plane of z operations in the x, y plane. So those will commute with the Hamiltonian, and um, they'll commute with the stabilizers, which correspond to pairs of planes. But if the number of spins, if we choose an n by n by n lattice where n is odd, then uh, these planar operators will collide at an even number of spins, so they'll anti-commute. And uh, then this can be described as an n cubed one n code. And you could, if you th wanted to do something like C0 operations, you could do them transversely by having a cube within another cube. Um, so I was just describing how one could implement those kinds of spin models and do some operations. Um, and we also heard about uh, surface codes. And um, there is a, a nice a general description given by Kataev back in 97 um, in terms of uh, uh, a spin lattice model where you have uh, vertex operators, these AV operators and face operators, BF operators, and um, generically you could do this over a set of operations which enforce local gauge constraints uh, for some finite group G. And um, in the case of the toric codes, these vertex operators were a product of X's on all the spins meeting at a vertex, and the faces were, face operators were products of Z's on the edges surrounding a face. Uh, but in um, this more generic construction, uh, you would have these vertex operators which would basically symmetrize over gauge transformations on the spins. So you would associate each level of the spins with some element of a group, a finite group, and um, depending on the orientation of an edge which underlies this, you can choose the orientations arbitrarily as long as you're consistent, then the action here is to, to uh, left multiply or right multiply uh, um, the uh, group element. And then the, the face operators enforce uh, 
this constraint that the product of the group elements around a face is the identity. So this is, you can think of this as sort of a enforcing a zero flux constraint. And all these operators commute with each other and the excitations are uh, generically localized anionic excitations. Um, so again, in the, the simple case where the, the group is Z2, then we have the, the toric code model. But of course, these things seem to involve many body operations and most of the physics that we can engineer is, is too local. So it would be nice to have some too local construction. And fortunately, we were uh, given a model that could do this uh, by Kataev, uh, published in 2006, uh, where this model takes place on a honeycomb where we have um, uh, spins now represented on the vertices of the lattice and ZZ interactions, blue, uh, XX, green, and YY, red. And uh, he was able to solve this model and then showed that in a particular regime where, say, one of these interactions is much, much greater than the other two, then uh, you can map the, each one of these links onto an effective spin half degree of freedom and then going to fourth order perturbation theory around plaquettes, you get an effective Hamiltonian that's four body in these new operators, which has an spectrum equivalent to the Torah code Hamiltonian. So this is nice, this gives us a basis in terms of just a two local model in which uh, in a particular phase we could at least probe some properties of a uh, surface code. So let's look at ways we could actually construct such things. And the general idea will be to use atoms or molecules trapped in optical lattices. Uh, optical lattices are just periodic potentials created by interfering uh, standing waves, lasers, as created by an induced dipole moment on the um, atoms or molecules. And you can generally do this coherently if you're far off optical resonance because you have a coherent shift which scales um, with intensity of the trapping light over the detuning, whereas the incoherent part goes as the intensity over detuning squared. So for large intensities and large detunings, this can be a, a very coherent trapping potential. You can trap things for <laughs> several seconds. And uh, the flexibility of, of having these potential created by lasers means that we can create different types of topographies. For instance, we can make these honeycomb traps or three-dimensional traps. And uh, there's some very advanced technology now for actually preparing single particles in single wells of lattices, uh, particularly following this uh, uh, superfluid to mod insulator phase transition, which was realized experimentally in 2003. Um, and um, this can be reliably prepared so that these are in motional ground states of uh, each lattice well. So let's look at how one could actually microscopically design these interactions that would give you the spin-spin interactions. Well, one approach is to map a Bose-Hubbard Hamiltonian uh, onto a lattice spin model. And uh, the idea here is that you have some atoms that are trapped in lattice wells, and these atoms have internal structure. They have uh, internal spin, and these could also have nuclear spin, as well as electron spin. And um, the different spin states can see different lattice potentials, and they can also have different collisional energies. So if we work in the subspace where we have one particle per well, and the spins can hop, then we'll have an effective interaction where a spin can hop to its nearest neighbor and then hop back. And if we just go to a Schwinger basis representation for um, the SU2 algebra um, and take into account these different spin interactions, we get an effective Hamiltonian which looks like an uh, XXZ model in 1D where the coefficients here depend upon the uh, relative tunneling strengths and collisional strengths, given as the square of the 
tunneling divided by the collisional interaction. So this is only valid in the limits that the uh, tunneling over the collisional strength is much, much less than one. So then it was realized uh, by uh, Duan, Daimler, and Lucan that uh, using this kind of interaction, we could actually use a tailored set of, of laser potentials so that we allow uh, tunneling, say, along this direction, only for spin components that are in the lowest, uh, uh, well, that, are, that correspond to spins oriented along x. And so you get an xx interaction and a yy for the tunneling along this other direction, and finally a ZZ interaction along this direction. And in doing so, then you get this, uh, this Hamiltonian that was corresponds to the honeycomb model. Um, so then putting these into a honeycomb lattice, we then could obtain that model. Unfortunately, the, the interactions aren't terribly large in this model. Um, for instance, it's limited to a second order process in tunneling, which is assumed small, and the collisional interactions are limited to the phase space density of two atoms in a well, which typically is on the order of five kilohertz. So it would be nice to have a way to make these larger. And um, so something that we've been looking at in Innsbruck is ways to do this with polar molecules using dipole-dipole interactions. And the idea is you trap a molecule per lattice well, and um, um, the, the molecules are just two constituents, atoms, different species that we can have a finite uh, dipole moment. And um, then the idea is that if you have a molecule in each lattice well, then we can excite uh, different rotational states using microwave fields. And if you're in a, a superposition of a ground and excited rotational state, then you'll have a finite dipole moment, and uh, these dipoles then will interact. And because it's a, an anisotropic interaction, the hope is that you could use this to engineer interactions uh, at, at, in the um, spin degrees of freedom. So the, the state space we're, we're considering at the, just the microscopic level here for two molecules is spin half, corresponding to the electron spin of the molecule. And there's a coupling between this ground rotational and an excited rotational state using a microwave field. Um, in this first excited rotational state, there's a splitting due to a, a, a rotation spin coupling, very similar to, analogous to an LS coupling for atoms. And um, then we'll just want to make use of this coupling uh, to uh, realize shifts in the ground's spin states for the two molecules. So uh, if you go to second order perturbation theory in um, the action of the, the microwave field on the internal states, that is, we consider ground states of a pair of molecules which are coupled off resonance to excited molecular states, or excited pair potential states for the two molecules, then um, as long as we're not too close to resonance, then we can see this as a shift in the ground states because we have selective coupling to excited states which are superpositions of different motional parity states and spin entangled states. And by using a, a variety of uh, polarizations and uh, frequencies, we can um, tune to these manifold of states in such a way that we realize um, shifts in the ground spin states corresponding to these effective interactions. So we can get Ising interactions, and Heisenberg interactions, etc. And it turns out you can get any permutation symmetric Hamiltonian on the uh, two molecules using up to six microwave fields. Okay, well, you would also like to not be able to just choose the type of interaction you have between pairs, but also sort of the range of this interaction. Uh, the dipole-dipole interaction falls off like one over R cubed, and maybe you would like to have much shorter range interactions. Well, 
That can be done to some extent by using the facts of one feature, that is, if you look here at the relative coordinate probability distribution for a pair of molecules separated by, say, one lattice site on a square lattice, that would correspond, say, to tuning here. Now, we might be worried about interactions with this next nearest neighbor, and that corresponds to this relative coordinate probability distribution. So this is uh, R, which is the separation between the two molecules. But at this field frequency, uh, this is, is quite far off resonance, but it's not zero. However, you can reduce the effect of the interactions at this next nearest neighbor by using an additional field which would tend to negate any residual interactions at this level. Um, and then, of course, there will be longer range interactions with further neighbors. You can use additional fields. Um, at some point, it becomes very complicated, and you have to do an optimization numerically to find out the uh, best way to get the type of interactions you want. And uh, this kind of thing can be fairly straightforwardly extended to spin one models. Um, and this, this is actually something that nature gives us uh, by virtue of uh, nuclear spin in these systems. So if uh, we include um, the uh, hyperfine interactions as well as electric quadrupole terms in, in, a, in a real type of molecule like uh, calcium chloride, then um, we, we could think about trying to engineer interactions using say, three states in one of these electronic hyperfine manifolds and call this an effective spin one. And, uh, well, the, the, the uh, physics becomes just more complicated, but you can still solve at least asymptotically for these potentials. And um, this is just giving a description of the uh, excited pair potentials uh, between two molecules. And again, using microwave fields, you can uh, engineer the type of interactions you get uh, between the spins. So this is an example of uh, a sort of a phase diagram of Hamiltonians that can be approximated on a spin one chain uh, using microwave fields. And here what I've looked at is the class of bilinear, biquadratic Hamiltonians. So this is involving a Heisenberg term and a Heisenberg squared term on these spin one particles where we might want to have different weights of these two couplings. And there are different phases associated with the ground states of these systems. So in this instance, we have a, a Haldane phase for this region of uh, the couplings, that region of theta. And there's a ferromagnetic regime, a dimerized regime. And uh, here, the, the color corresponds to the quality of the simulation. So um, it quantifies the uh, soup norm or the difference of the Hamiltonian that you want versus the one you get using your uh, microwave fields to engineer it. And um, so in particular for these isolated points here, we can get a, a realization which has an, an error of 0.05 at uh, this kind of lattice spacing, which seems quite small. Lattice spacing corresponds to half of the, uh, the optical wavelength, which is trapping. It turns out this 400 nanometers is the optical wavelength you can use to trap these molecules and uh, can be done in an experiment. And then uh, we can look at the next nearest neighbors uh, to confirm that those would be small interactions. And in fact, these same points then get these, these next nearest neighbor interactions quite small as well. So to verify that we can actually do something interesting with this model or see some behavior uh, that would be consistent with uh, having the target model, we can look at uh, some observables that would be of interest. For instance, uh, spin structure factors. So. Uh, these are common quantities that are studied for such spin chains um, involving uh, looking at the uh, Fourier transform of uh, expectation values of product operators. And um, for two of the realizations on this phase diagram, uh, 
The, uh, the dotted line corresponds to the, um, the spin structure factor for the Z components uh, in, the, in the realization using the microwave fields and the solid line corresponds to the ideal case. So at least we see that we can get the right qualitative behavior. In particular, you see these period three peak for the, the, the Elias Sutherland point. Um, and this kind of spin structure factor could be measured in experiments, for instance, doing a time of flight measurement where you'd have your molecules trapped on a chain in a lattice and you could drop them and so you get a, a second order uh, correlation measurements in terms of the intensity intensity interference, um, which would be spin dependent in this case, and uh, by varying the difference between the separation of these detectors, uh, you can actually extract what this structure factor would be. Okay, so an application of such a chain could be uh, as a, a quantum communication channel. So in particular, at uh, the, the points in the model where you have this weight being one third of this weight, uh, then you can rewrite this as a, as a Hamiltonian involving a sum of projectors on a total spin two for nearest neighbors. And uh, this was exactly solved long ago now um, in terms of uh, valence bond solid states which uh, are, are basically obtained by thinking about each spin one as a subspace of virtual spin halves. And you start off with a bunch of singlets connecting the spin halves and then you symmetrize uh, to give you your spin one at each site. And um, this Hamiltonian on an open chain is fourfold degenerates, but you can make it singly degenerates by adding spin half particles and uh, an extra Hamiltonian on each term, which sort of effectively closes the chain so you get the total singlet state. And that the ground state then can be represented as a matrix product state um, where these coefficients involve actions on the boundary spin half particles. So it was realized that this would, be a this would be a model that you could use to teleport quantum information. So you could um, do measurements at the single particle level along this chain and remain in a chain which is gapped. Uh, I should state that this model is gapped even in the thermodynamic limit. And you could propagate uh, the information along the chain and in the end create an entangled state or at least be able to transmit quantum information. And there are some more recent ideas for how one might actually perform uh, one-way quantum computation with such models because uh, you can think about this matrix product representation as just a way to uh, perform a time evolution of uh, a single logical qubit in the one-way model. Okay, so um, I did want to talk about how we could realize some of these uh, protected quantum memories, uh, particularly for the compass models. And uh, here is, is a realization of the 2D compass model where we have the XX interactions along this direction and YY or, or ZZ interactions along this direction. And um, for finite systems or relatively small size systems, there's a gap at the point where the coupling between ZZ and XX is, is equal. Uh, although there's some evidence that this, this gap goes to zero uh, quite quickly as the system size increases. Um, however, we do find for, for small system sizes that you do have this gap. And at the opposite points, what you get are a series of Ising stripes with two L full degenerate ground states where L is the size of one of the edges here. Um, well, uh, you can realize this model by tuning microwaves to a particular resonance which favors interactions that are ZZ along one direction and then doing a rotation um, onto the orthogonal axis then gives you the XX interactions. And we find that uh, um, if you play with three resonances, you can actually substantially reduce uh, 
uh, residual unwanted interaction terms so that you get the dominant uh, interactions being of what you like. So to verify that, in fact, you get some of the, the macroscopic properties that are desirable from this model, uh, we looked at two quantities, the RMS magnetization of the ground states. Um, this should be zero if you're in the symmetric case where the XX and ZZ couplings are the same. And uh, here, this is a plot of this RMS magnetization. Um, as a function of the field frequency. Um, and we find that right at this, this resonant point, which is the ideal region, uh, you get a zero in this RMS magnetization. And if you choose that frequency, then, then we can look to see what happens to the gap in the model. So uh, we looked at the um, um, susceptibility tensor and you see that if you're in the symmetric case where the XX and ZZ couplings are the same, then you have a, a gap to um, coupling uh, to excited states. And if you're in the regime where they're different, or substantially different in fact, then uh, the gap is zero. So uh, the realization of this uh, can be quantified in terms of a coupling graph where we have um, the edges here corresponding to existence of a coupling and the color corresponds to the character. So we have this is ZZ, um, XX, and YY. Um, and this is now done for the 3D compass model. Um, and uh, it's at the outer reach, it is possible to have it such that your coupling here at nearest neighbor could be up to 100 kilohertz. Um, that's really probably, when I say realistic, that's probably the best you could do. So uh, more, perhaps uh, a, a more uh, reasonable estimate of the effective interaction you could have here would be maybe 50 kilohertz, simply because it's very hard to get these, these uh, molecules so close together. Um, so, given that there's a way to engineer this Hamiltonian, then this can be used to actually engineer the, the honeycomb uh, lattice model. And the idea here is that we still have XX, YY, and ZZ interactions along an orthogonal trine, but we trap our, our molecules on, in two parallel planes Here's uh, one lattice and then the lattice underneath it, which is shifted um, in such a way that the nearest neighbor coupling graph uh, corresponds to the honeycomb model. Okay, so there are some ways to actually make these models, but we'd like to have a way to actually perform operations on them. So for the subsystem codes in, in the 2D model, we needed string operators. In the 3D model, we needed planar operators. And for the surface codes, we need to be able to do string operations. Um, so one way to do this is uh, to use an ancillary degree of freedom in order to mediate some many-body gate between the spins. Uh, there are a couple ways uh, we looked at doing this. One is to use a single photon uh, as sort of a bus which would uh, mediate an interaction between the spins. Another way is to use uh, an argument inspired by geometric phase gates. And there's a, a nice treatment I found of this um, recently in an uh, article by Wang and Zanardi. And the idea is to use some bosonic channel uh, and perform conditional displacement operators dependent upon the total spin components of your system. So we do a displacement operator here that depends upon spin, a displacement here, back here, and back here. And uh, these conditional displacement operators can be decomposed in terms of a displacement operator conjugated by a um, coupling evolution between the total spin component Z and uh, the number operator in that bosonic channel. And the action here is if you start off in the vacuum 
uh, for the field and some system state, then this performs the unitary evolution on the system where it's described by this unitary. And so if you just pick the phase here appropriate for the parity of your system um, and the right interaction time theta, then you realize this unitary that's generated by a product of operators. And this is exactly the kind of thing you'd want to do if you wanted to do logical gates on your, on your subsystem codes. Um, so the, the sort of the resources we need at the physical level are um, some, some spin field coupling and the ability to do coherent state displacements. So what we're considering here is having an optical lattice with trapped molecules or atoms that could be immersed into a cavity. And uh, then we want to have spin-dependent field couplings. So this could, in fact, be done by um, using a field where there's some difference between couplings of the one spin state and the zero spin state to the excited states such that we get an effective coupling, uh, which depends like the square of the atom field coupling divided by the detuning from the um, transition. And um, uh, it may not seem terribly reasonable to actually stick a lattice inside a cavity, but there are already some experiments along this direction for 1D lattices. And um, in principle, it seems not something that is, is a major obstacle, although uh, getting good cavities uh, in the regimes where you have uh, this kind of sizable lattice in there may not be terribly easy at this point. Uh, well, you can extend this idea to actually do controlled many body operators, where at the level of doing this coherent state displacement, you do it conditional upon the state of some ancilla. So the ancilla could be another physical atom molecule, or it could be another degree of freedom within the cavity. You could use a different cavity mode. And in doing that, if you go around this geometric phase gates, you get a unitary which is conditional on the ancilla being in state one. So what this gives us is the ability to do controlled many body operators. Well, all this is predicated upon the fact that we can actually select a certain sub-region of our spins to do the operations. So for instance, with a 2D compass model, we just want to do a, a string of operations. Well, how do we address just a string of spins in an optical lattice? It's not so trivial to do because the particles are spaced by an optical wavelength, so you can't just use uh, laser focusing uh, to naively be able to address those kinds of spins. Um, and there have been a couple suggestions for how one might do this in terms of mapping things you don't want to interact to dark states. So the idea is, um, say we want to do an operation on some domain of spins. Well, we choose some shaped fields so that these fields are zero at the locations of spins that we do want to interact. And then for the unwanted regions, there'll be a non-zero control field here, omega c. And then we use a stir-up pulse, which maps the states of the unwanted domains to some other state which won't interact. So here, for instance, let's say we have a qubit in a zero and one state. Then for the unwanted domains, we'll want to map all the spin one states to some non-interacting state, R. So we want alpha zero plus beta one to go to alpha zero plus beta R in the unwanted regime. Well, it turns out you can do this using stir out pulses in a way that doesn't depend upon the strength of this intensity. And um, the idea just works by first using a counterintuitive pulse sequence where you have you first apply this laser and then you, you turn on this laser and ramp this one down. And if you wait long enough, you can in fact with very high probability map all the states of, of all the spins in the region where the control field is non-zero onto some dark state. How much time? <laughs>
Okay, thanks. Um, you could also use standing waves to realize this. So I could um, precisely choose the nodes of the standing wave to correspond to uh, locations of the domain I want to address at the end, and then everything that's not at those nodes will then be coupled to dark states. So in this way, you could uh, address planes or strings, or in fact, using some holographic techniques, you, you could choose more non-trivial shapes, for instance, loops. So one application of this would be to do uh, any ionic interferometry in a, a service code model. Um, so the general idea will be to start off with some ancillary degree of freedom, which we'll use as our measurement probe, and use this ancilla to perform controlled many-body rotations. So we'll have our quantum memory here, and we'll do controlled string rotation here, string rotation, string rotation, string rotation, and then measure the probe. And um, uh, the way that we want to get at to any onic statistics is to look at the back action of the um, action of string operators that act non-contractably on our system. So for instance, we can think of the braiding of an X-type particle in the Tora code model with a Z-type particle as the action of a string weave on a uh, 2D lattice. And um, so uh, just looking um, where we actually have indicated the locations of the, uh, the spins here, this would correspond to a, a Z string and this would correspond to an X string. And at the level of a physical implementation of this model and the honeycomb uh, lattice model, th these, these types of operations on the physical spins in the honeycomb model correspond to the Z string and the X string. And so we want to see the action of applying this string weave on the ground state. And if you, if you apply this string weave, you get the minus one phase, which is just due to the um, anti-commutation properties of these strings when they collide at one point. So to measure this, you would do something that's pretty much a straightforward extension of what Giannis described uh, for the, the very minimal single plaquette model with the photons, um, where you start off with an ancilla prepared in zero plus one, and this path you apply some string operators, and on this path you do nothing, and then you finally measure the uh, state of the probe and extract the uh, statistical phase. Um, it's very important that when you would do this experiment, you would repeat it to verify that this uh, relative phase is invariant under isotopy of the strings. So it shouldn't depend upon the shape of the string as long as it goes from one end to the other. In fact, as a counterexample, if you performed this type of interferometry in the 2D compass model, if you just used straight string operators, you would get this same relative phase popping up because there again, the strings anti-commute. But we know that if you deform those strings, those strings no longer preserve the ground subspace, whereas in the, uh, the surface code model here, they do. So, uh, well, we'd like to know how well you could perform these operations in the, the, the case of losses. For instance, there'll be cavity decay as well as single particle decay. Okay, just a second. I'll finish up here. Uh, and it turns out that um, you can exactly solve for the process fidelity of this gate in the, in, um, the regime of having cavity decay and a simplified model for the um, spin decay. And uh, basically we find that depending on whether you use a single photon to mediate the gates or coherent states, um, you can still have rather large fidelities for system sizes of 9, 25. It's, it's not very sensitive on the system size. Uh, in fact, it's independent for the process fidelity as measured by the average case.
Uh, worst case fidelity is dependent on the square root of the system size. So uh, at least this, this gives uh, some optimism for being able to apply many body gates in these kinds of systems. So with that, I'll just close with uh, my conclusions. Thanks. This was, th this, these are the dark spots in order to deactivate regions? Ah. How do you know they're not coupled to one another? Yeah, so actually what happens there is you would, I at this level, you would turn off your interactions and then do the mapping. Okay. Then you do global operations, then turn them back on. Yeah, you're right. And generically, there will still be there will still be the interactions if you didn't do that. Yeah. Uh, you, you, sh you saw this, uh, I think, picture with uh, you and Pepper's variables. Yeah. Uh, in the experiment, how, how big you can be or how can you argue? Uh, so you, uh, we get to be around 7 kilohertz. So in that diagram, where are we starting? U is the radial yeah. axis. Uh, um, yeah, this was this was done for uh, lattice spacing of 200 nanometers, and uh, this is experimental experimentally feasible, and that's actually working on an optical transition for calcium chloride. Um, but of course, the experiments haven't actually succeeded in trapping single molecules yet, but uh, they're working on that. <laughs>